Well, I'd like you to look at the book of Acts in chapter 1. In verse 11, and we'll go as, as far as we can and stop and have communion, however long that will be. Let me say in preface that the book of Acts, and as S. Lewis Johnson once said, he said, the book of Acts, we call it the Acts of the Apostles. It's really the Acts of the risen Lord uh, by the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. That's the book. And this may be People will ask me a lot of times, do you have a favorite book? You know, the Bible to me is the book. And so I don't really look at the parts of the Bible as books of the Bible. They're chapters of the story. And there is a particular chapter in the biblical story that I love to read and reread. And it's the uh, story of the early church that is the book of Acts. And it's because the book of Acts gives you a mountain to sit on like no other book. The book of Acts gives the supreme perspective of world history. And I'll tell you why. Because the book of Acts is the first log of the church. It's the standard of Christianity. Whenever you cut wood to go in your fireplace, your first cut of wood becomes the standard by which all other cuts are taken. You don't modify it each time by making the last one the standard. Just like in the church, the standard of the church cannot be the church of the Middle Ages or the church at the fall of Rome in the uh, uh, 5th century. Uh, it can't be the current church or the European church. The log of the church is the book of Acts. That's the standard of the church. It's the church is that institution that took the truth of the God of Israel, the true God, and it took it to the whole world. That's why when you look in your table of contents in the Bible, you go Genesis through Deuteronomy, the law of God to Israel. Then you go Joshua and following the history of the nation of Israel. And then you get the prophets of Israel. You get the poetry books by Solomon and Job and the like to Israel. And then you get the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, where Christ came to Israel. Uh, then you get the book of Acts that goes to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then where? Out of most parts of the earth. All of a sudden, you start in Jerusalem, and by the time you get to Acts 8, you're in, Sam in uh, um, uh, Samaria, and then you end up in, Paul starts to the outermost parts, and you end up, Acts, in another city. It's not Jerusalem. It's not Antioch. What city is it? Rome. And I show a guy the table of contents of the Bible, and it's all Jewish until you get after the book of Acts. And all of a sudden, you got now the book of Romans, the book of Corinth, just north of Lake Dallas, where the gospel then went. <laughs> all right. Then you go to the Celts of Galatia, then Ephesus, the place that was a, uh, the temple of Diana, the goddess Diana. Um, Philippi, that was like uh, Killeen, all right? It's, a, it's an army fortress named after Philip of Macedon, a Macedonian, the father of Alexander the Great of Greek, Colossae, Thessalonica. And so you start getting into the explosion, this leavening that goes out from Israel to the entire world. And so, it takes the church, takes the truth of the God of creation, the God of Passover, and the God of Sinai, and it takes it into Rome. The Roman Empire falls, Christianity holds it together, and then it begins to flood throughout Europe, and then it comes over across the oceans into the Americas. And so that is the story of history. 
is uh, all that the church, is, the church touched produces Western civilization because that's the direction that Paul went was West. Uh, he ended up in Rome and so it is a Western phenomena. Really, Western civilization isn't Western civilization. It is Christian civilization. And the reason because of that is that the entire worldview of all of the barbarian tribesmen in the Roman Empire, when the Roman Empire fell and Christianity took over, they evangelized them. Uh, the monastery settled all of Europe and brought technology. And the Judeo Christian worldview now went out among the barbarians and they forsook their gods, they became Christians, and this leavening process of the light and the salt of Israel's deity now went out to the whole world, which was prophesied. God said to Abraham, in your seed shall the who be blessed? The nations will be blessed. And so, Western civilization, its view of God as being infinite and personal, Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, of which man is a finite picture of what God is infinitely, that God is a good God and a loving God and a just God and a holy God, and all of those qualities that we hold as precious find their anchor in God. See, that is not a philosophic, sociological worldview. That is a Christian worldview. It is not a Muslim worldview. It is not a Hindu worldview. It is not a Buddhist worldview. It is a Jewish worldview that was proposed by Christ and the apostles that came to the Gentile world. Are you with me? That's Western civilization. The church did that. Uh, the view that there is final truth that God makes himself known. That is a Christian idea of a revelation from God to man that is testable in history and in time and space. That's a Christian idea. Postulates about who the deity is, anybody. You can invent your own religion. Go ahead. But as far as having one that will line up with science, history, archaeology, and be externally consistent in morality, that will be the dream of man in pen and ink, that is a Christian idea, a Jewish idea. Uh, science coming by the study of a creation, the creation that is not a god, the creation that do, does not have gods and spirits behind it, giving it meaning, but one that is made by God with divine law that is reasonable, and it gives the idea of the satisfaction of curiosity and induction and study, and now you come up with science, and when you teach it, it becomes education. When you apply it to the needs of man, it becomes medicine and uh, architecture and the like, the subduing of the earth, the idea of ethics, that there is right and wrong when it's applied in government, that kings and republics are held by a divine standard. That is a Christian idea. Uh, the fact that there is a man in the image of God and he's not simply part of the creation. He's distinct from it as being unique. The idea that art can reflect what is really there with great beauty, that man can stand objective outside of creation and see it and draw it and write about it and animate it and make it beautiful. That is a Christian idea, a Jewish idea. And so, in everything the church touched, it gave birth to the greatest civilization the world has ever known. And we have enjoyed it for 20 centuries. And the more you enact the Christian worldview, the better it gets if it's done right. Only in the 20th century, have we now abandoned the idea of the Judeo-Christian idea of God. And we have now made man a God in secular humanism. Not Christian humanism, that you saw man is good and you look for the reasons, but secular humanism, where you get rid of God. Only that century has produced the 20th century that isn't doing real well. 
if you haven't noticed. It is the century of blood, of the isms, of Nazism, communism, existentialism, Darwinism, and it's produced our greatest horror. Well, Westerns, are y'all with me so far? Okay. I'm trying, I want to show you why this book is so important. The Gospels are useless if they can't be followed by a book, a book of the Acts of the Risen Lord. Uh, Western civilization has ebbed and it has flowed. It has succeeded and it has failed. And it has failed because of its proximity or its lack of proximity to the Christian message. The Christian message has ebbed and flowed and failed and succeeded in direct relation to the church's proximity, to the message's proximity to the book of Acts. And that's why I say that this correct understanding of the book of Acts lets you stand on a mountain and see where we've come from, where we are, and where we are going. That's the book of Acts. The Gospels show 35 years of the perfect life on earth. The book of Acts is a 35-year period about the life of Christ from heaven. The Gospels say, here is a man. The book of Acts says, here are his people. That's what they look like. There is the church, the ecclesia, those called out from the world to comprise the body of Christ, the life of Christ on the earth. There's what they look like. And so Acts, like Jesus told in the parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, the smallest of seeds. It grows to be a great tree that fills, that's larger than all the other garden plants. And the birds of the air come and find rest in its branches. The book of Acts is the mustard seed. Twelve people that get together, 120 people, that become 5,000 people. And ultimately that little seed comes to be the largest of the garden plants. It comes to be Christianity and civilization. And the birds of the air, hello birds, they come and find nest in its branches. Uh, let me tell you something you can measure your friends with. The idea of Western civilization goes back to Genesis 9. Did you know that? Whenever Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and God said uh, of Ham, his son Canaan would be cursed because of Ham's sin and scoffing his father and rebelling against his father. And the Canaanites formed a civilization in Canaan that would be judged. So God states that about the Canaanites. And then he says, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. The word Shem means the name. Blessed be Yahweh. Blessed be the Lord. The word Yahweh is the what of God? Name. Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Shem. The name, it's a play on words. Blessed be the Lord, I'm quoting here from Genesis 9. Blessed be the name of God, God of the name. God would put his name with the, the Shemitic people, the Semites. What is the most famous nation that is a Semitic nation? Israel. And so God says, I'm going to put the historic knowledge of who I am from creation passed on from Adam to Seth, through Enoch, to Noah, I'm going to give it to the Semites. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. And then he says, and Japheth, let him, Japheth means enlarged. The Japhethitic people are Indian guys, the Europeans, uh, basically, all of those of Europe, all the Indo-European, all the white boys, the word Japheth means one who cannot jump. Did you know that? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It means to enlarge, okay? And he says, uh, let Japheth dwell in the tents of Shem. 
the Japhethites will dwell in the tents of Shem. They will find protection and hospitality and blessing. All of these Europeans, all of these Canadians, these Americans, these South Americans, down to the Australians, they're going to find blessedness in the tent of a Jew. Are you all particularly fond of a particular Jew? I am too. And so the gospel is going to spread among the Japhethites. And it's them in the later centuries that will begin the modern missions movement to all of the Hamitic and all of the other Semitic nations and the Arabs. Isn't that interesting? And so we're going to see it happen here in the beginning of what is called Western civilization. The Apostle Paul will do his first journey, then he'll wonder where to go. He'll start going north, then he'll try to go back east, and the Spirit of God will say, no, don't go there. And then he gets a vision, and it's a vision of a man. And the man says, come over here and help us. And so he heads to the west. And that man was the what man? Macedonian man. He's a Greek and so we cross the Hellespont, and now we go into Europe. And so Western civilization that is going to comprise the basis of Christian civilization that's going to be the light for the next two millennia has its beginning in the mustard seed of the book of Acts. Okay? Uh, the Old Testament, stick with me, is the Father promising that someone's coming. The book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the son fulfilling the father's promise to come and die. The book of Acts on through the explanation of the New Testament epistles is the time of what the father promised and the son did. Now, who do you think is the major figure in the New Testament? The Holy Spirit. And he is going to enact the promise that the Son laid down, that the Father gave. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, the Old Testament is anticipation. Somebody's coming. The Gospels are manifestation. Somebody's here. The book of Acts is proclamation. We're going to herald it to the entire world. And so, when the book of Acts begins, the meta-narrative continues. The story that began in the book of Genesis is now going to continue in the book of Acts. All right? Well, let's take a look here. In verse 1, the first account I composed, and Luke here is speaking of, incidentally, y'all know who Luke is. Luke is going to appear in Acts 14. He's a, a um, doctor that lives in Troas. I've been there, all right? He stood on the shore of the Hellespont. When you go from uh, Asia into Europe, you cross this little leg of the Adriatic, and it's called the Hellespont. And uh, it's moving from east to west. Paul picks up a doctor, which he needed. All right. He picks up a doctor in ancient Troas, and Luke is going to be his traveling companion. At the end of his life, Luke is there. Uh, it's, I've often thought about this. You know what Troas, where Luke is from, who's going to write? He's the only Gentile author in the, in the entire Bible. He writes the book of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, he is from Troas. Troas is the site of ancient Troy, as in the, the Trojan. And uh, they were the ones that, uh, of course, are the great, uh, the great civilization there. And it's like you're going to see from Troy a doctor that's going to go to the Gentile world with Jewish ointment for them. And so... Luke says, the first account I composed, that's the gospel of Luke, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. And so we have the book of Luke, and now we have another account that's the book of Acts. So the story continues. It doesn't end 
with the ascension of Christ and the Gospels. The story now continues. And so in verse 2, uh, he says, until the day when he was taken up to heaven. Now, what that does is it connects the book of Acts with Luke 24 and verse 51. Luke said in 24, 21 of the gospel of Luke, Jesus ascended into heaven. He backs up to that point, and now he's going to splice it in to the book of Acts, and the narrative is going to continue. Just like when you're watching a TV, made-for-TV serial, it'll begin with, last week we saw, and then you'll splice in the rest of it. And so, he's going to give here in verse 2, five cardinal ideas. You know what the word cardinal means? It means a hinge. It's an old Latin word for hinge. The guys that choose the Pope, they are called the cardinals. It goes either way upon these guys. Well, the word cardinal means an integral thing that can turn either way. And so Luke is going to give you here in the first 11 verses cardinal truths about the church that the church can go either way and they have to have these in place. I'll give you a hint. He's not going to talk about our buildings. He's not going to talk about our dress codes. He's not going to talk about times that we meet, how long you preach, or how you order your service. He's not going to talk about any of that. He's going to talk not about the form of the church, but its function, its life, its indispensables. Well, in verse 2, Write down your first cardinal, write down mission. It says, by the Holy Spirit, he gave orders. We have orders. We have a mission. We have a mandate. We have a purpose. That the Christian life is not us asking God to bless our personal ambitions. You dig? He's not our genie that we ask him now to bless our personal lives and make us happy and successful. He has orders. Matter of fact, that word order is a strong word. We get the word intel. And it, it's the word used when it says Joseph gave orders concerning his bones. Take to all of Joseph's next of Ken, you take me back home. This is the same word. Our heavenly Joseph gave an order to his people. And here's the, well, we're going to see what the order is in verse 8. It's a message. You will be my witnesses. That the mission of the church is to be a witness. That doesn't mean an expert witness. We don't have to know everything about God in reality, but we are a, a witness of a particular historical event. And here you see it in verse 3. To these, meaning the apostles, he presented himself alive after suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them over 40 days. Our message is of a physical person that we ate with, that we touched, who did a very physical thing. He died upon the cross for our sins. And he has mortal wounds on an immortal body. He rose from the dead. Our message is the holy grail. It is the golden fleece of all philosophy, theology, and religion. And if that is true, then you can do away with philosophy and religions because you have truth. What is it? If God becomes a man and the man becomes a sinner and the living one becomes a dead one and then rises from the dead for what we did, I now don't have to philosophize and figure out who God is. I now have the word become flesh. Amen? So you just did away with philosophy. And I don't have to earn now my way 
out of sin, death, to, to work and figure out how I'm going to see my loved ones beyond the grave. If that divine being lives the life I should have lived and dies the death that I deserve to die, I now no longer need philosophy and I no longer need a way to get to God. I have the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? And so that's why I say, a human being that rose from the dead with wounds on him because of his divine perfection that can declare me righteous is the Holy Grail. It is the fountain of immortal youth and we need look no more. It's the ultimate that a deity can do. The incarnation, substitution, and resurrection of God for his people. And so we are witnesses of that event, that we are a supernatural people and we talk about the crossing of history with God. And you also see in verse 3 that there's a time limit on this message of these people's mission. He spoke at the end of verse 3 about the kingdom of God. That is talking about his return. You see him mention it also in verse 6. Is it at this time you're restoring the, king, the kingdom? You see it again in verse 11. This Jesus will return. Whenever God in 11 verses tells you something three times, that's important. And so what is our mission? Our mission is to tell the story that Jesus Christ came and died and rose again. And this message has a time limit that it will end someday. The world is not going to go on meandering its way into wherever. There is a fixed time. You see it there in verse 7, an epoch that is fixed by the Father's authority. Now is the day of salvation. It's just like the ark gets built and before the door is shut, we have seven days of in gathering. You critters are alerted by God. You get to the ark. You go to Noah, your savior, and God will shut the door. And then when the day of the Lord comes, it will be lifted up. But that day will come. Y'all believe that? So y'all believe that a divine being became a human being. Is that what you're saying? So you believe the Old Testament stuff about the promises and the prophecies of God. You believe that, okay. And you believe there was an incarnation. Is that right, Joel? Do you believe that? You look kind of silly to me, Joel. And y'all believe that he died a substitution for man. Is that what you're saying? And he rose from the dead and he saves by faith those who put their trust in him. That's what you're saying. And you believe that this period of grace where God will, in verse, uh, in verse 4 and 5, will baptize men in the Holy Spirit and identify them with Christ and give them life. You believe that this ultimate message that we have is going to end someday in the fire of the day of the Lord. Y'all believe that? Okay. Just want to make sure. The reason we do this, Rick, is that we will practice church discipline in the service. And we will remove the infidels. Okay. And so, verse 4. We have the mission, we have the message, and now we have, look back up again into uh, verse, verse 2. We have men. He gave orders to the apostles. And in verse 3, they are eyewitnesses of something. The, the basis of authority of the church is not our philosophical reasoning. There are 12 men that he showed himself to. And they are not brilliant men. They're not great organizers and leaders. They are Miriam. Miriam sang the song at the Red Sea of what she saw, of what God did, taking them through the Red Sea. And she sang about it. The leaders of the church are not brilliant individuals. 
They're guys that stood back like Miriam and watched what God did in the birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and sending of the Holy Spirit. And so that is the foundation of Christian truth, is the apostles. Apostello, to send forth. And God now sends forth this message by eyewitnesses. And thus, they're going to write. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will guide you, meaning the 12, into how much of the truth? All the truth. And they will pen. We're going to add a guy to him named Saul of Tarsus. And they're going to be the authorities that will write. So if you're going to write a New Testament book, you have to show first that you have authority. You saw the risen Lord. And if you didn't, you are one that is under the wing of an apostle, like Luke to Paul, like Mark to Peter. And you saw it. As a matter of fact, whenever they have to replace Judas with somebody, there is one criteria that you get to have to be an apostle. And you see it in verse 21 and 22 of chapter 1. Of all the men who accompanied us, the time Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day he was taken up, one of these must become a, what's it say? A witness. You were there with John the Baptist all the way through the ministry. You saw him die and you saw him rose. Saw him rose. That's not right. You saw him rise. (laughs) You saw him rise. See, God does not take brilliant people to spread his message. And so you have to be a witness. So those men wrote the New Testament writings that are the stones. Tu es Petras. You are Peter. It means a stone. And upon this Petra, foundation of Christ, I'll build my church. Peter was the leader of the 12 that were the stones upon which the church is built. And that is upon not philosophical writings, not moral mandates, not tradition. But it's the inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit, through verifiable witnesses. And that's why when the last apostle dies, what's his name? John. When he dies, in about 90 AD, he finishes the last book. And it's a book that looks through the churches in Revelation 2 and 3 to the church in heaven, Revelation 4 and 5 to the judgment of the world and the tribulation in Revelation 6 through 18, to the second coming in Revelation 18, to the kingdom, I'm sorry, Revelation 19, the second coming, the kingdom in Revelation 20, and new heavens and a new earth in Revelation 21, 22. And he ends with, he ends with, they shall reign forever. And then what does God say when he signs off? Whenever KHVN signs off. That's a joke. He says... You add to this book, I add to you the curses. wonder what he meant. You take away from this book, I take your part from the tree of life. That it is the quality of a pagan to try to come up with book 67. It's done. Nobody gets to take away. Nobody gets to add. It's inerrant in what has been said, and it's final in what has been said. Amen? So we don't add to this book because the apostles have died. So the next time somebody bikes on up to your door and says, hey, I got a new religion based on my writings that I've got from this guy. I don't care if it's Joseph Smith, Mary Baker, Eddie, Judge Rutherford of Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't care if it's Sun Mung Moon. I don't care if it's whoever. If they show you an authoritative means of knowing God, you ask first, are you an apostle? You were there with John. You saw the resurrection. If they don't have it, then you send them on their way. Salvation, Jesus said, is of the Jew. 
you got nothing to say. So, we have here our mission that is to tell the truth about a message. You don't have to be clever. You don't have to be nifty. You do have to have moral courage to state the truth. And we have a basis of knowledge. We have men, the apostles, and their writings. You remember where Jesus said, Father, I pray for all who will believe through their word that they might be one. You and I all believed by the, ultimately you can trace all of us back to one of those 12 men that heard the gospel or that preached it and came to us. And you remember that Thomas saw the wounds on him and he fell down. He said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, blessed are you because you believed and saw. More blessed are those who believed and did not see. That there's going to be a bunch of people brought in that will not see firsthand Christ, but they will believe through the message that is preached. Just like the Jew that woke up after being beaten, left half dead, and some Jew came by and fixed him and paid for him and carried him home and took care of him. And he woke up and he said, where is he? Well, he's gone. But then they said, he's coming back. And he's going to pay what needs to be. He'll finish the deal. So he's coming back for us. Well, in verse 4 and in verse 5, here is the means by which this is fulfilled. And gathering them together, he commanded them. Now, first, he's going to tell them in verse 8 to go. Now, he says, don't leave. Wait for what the Father promised, which you heard from me. Because John baptized with water, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. The means by which the message is going to be proclaimed is going to be the Holy Spirit of God. That's what he means in verse 2 when he says that by the Holy Spirit he gave orders. Uh, it, Jesus is going to say it again in verse 8. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Three times. You can't do your mission. You can't preach your message that is brought to you by these men without the power of the Holy Spirit. We're a supernatural people. Our day is what's called a day of a closed universe. That it came out of nothing. It is governed by natural law. Man is nothing but, a, but an animal that has evolved the illusion of mind, will, that actually are just determined by forces on him. We don't know where he came from, what he is. We don't know what is ultimately right or wrong. And we don't know where we're going. Have a nice day. That is what has happened to Western civilization. It's called a closed system of natural causes. It's just ping pong balls bouncing around, and we don't know anything that is above us, which is a logical conclusion if you reject God, his word, and his son. You and I do not live in a closed system of natural causes. Do you all believe that? I want to make sure. You guys believe that God exists outside of nature and gave his word that promised that the Trinity, the second member, would become a man and would die and rise and God could invade our lives and give conversion and, and give his word to guide us and someday take us home and someday blow the whistle and say, everybody out of the pool and end this creation and make a new one. Joel, you believe that? Are you sure? So you're not really current, is what you're saying. Amen. Amen. Because when you believe the other way, you end up killing yourself in time. It'll drive you mad. We are people who believe in the assumption of an open system where God can do what he has done and what he is pleased to do. You hear that train go off? But when they agree with me. All right. And so, the way you're going to do this is by the Holy Spirit. 
He is going to empower us to preach. When we open our mouth, he is going to give us the strength and the courage to stand and the clarity to communicate. And the Holy Spirit is going to call to himself the elect and open their heart to respond. And he's going to convict the world, lost men, of their sin, their lack of righteousness, and the imminency of judgment, sin, righteousness, and judgment. And so we are a supernatural people in our mission and our message, the men that govern us and the means by which it's done is the Holy Spirit of God. If we forget this, that we're a supernatural people, what's going to happen is we're going to make our goal attainable by the flesh. And then we're going to be a people that lose sight of what we're here to do. And we're going to be committed to rules and ceremonies and nothing but mere orthodox doctrine and tradition and to emotion and social fellowships and just doing social good. We're going to become, become the kind of church that non-Christians make fun of. That's nothing but a human oiled institution. We are a miracle people. That verse five, the bab we will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you what that means. The Old Testament, the Spirit of God enabled kings, prophets, priests, and judges to do a particular job. But the full baptism of the Spirit, the rebirth, as Jesus died and came up from the dead, the Spirit of God unites us with Him in its fullness. And we now have imputation of a new nature to us, the Spirit of God places us in Christ. We are justified. We are regenerated. We're enlightened. We're gifted. We are sealed. We're given the earnest of the Spirit, and He will raise us from the dead. And so God doesn't merely enlighten and enable us. We die, and we rise up anew with Christ. We're a new people on the earth. And that is why they ask in verse 6, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom, because the Old Testament says that when Messiah comes, that he will, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, Joel 2, Isaiah 55, that he is going to take the world and he is going to wash them by the washing of rebirth and renew them by the Holy Spirit. He will pour his spirit out on all flesh. And so... Always one Arminian that's in the crowd. <laughs> that's what he was yelling. My God, did you hear that ridiculous idiot up there? <laughs> and so, I'm going to win this kid. I don't care. You, we'd be here all day. All right. What was I talking about? <laughs> oh, yeah. And so this promise of the Holy Spirit's work is accompanies Messiah. And so when he said, you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit, they immediately say, is it now you're restoring the kingdom? Is this it? We're on the Mount of Olives where you're going to return back to. Zechariah chapter 12 says, is this the kingdom? And Jesus said in verse 7, no, it's not. That's fixed by the Father's authority. So who are we? We are a kingdom people in a world that the kingdom has not been fully experienced. The kingdom of God has been inaugurated in the church, but it has not been fully completed in the world. We are, let me give you the, what the proper theologians would say, we are an embassy on the earth of heavenly people. We are an advanced team of a future extraterrestrial takeover of the universe. We're the advanced team. We are the people that give a warning to the world that this flood is coming. We are the people that are an gathering out of the nations that forsake their idols, and we're the first of a world of which Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. We are the first ones. 
to say Jesus is Lord and God is raised him from the dead. Amen? We're, somebody get the phone. We're the first. We are a proof to all of the world that what we say is going to happen can happen because they can walk in here and they can see men who beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And study war no more. You see oneness, a united nations of people. And we are a point of jealousy to God's chosen people that they have rejected the truth. Israel looks at us and gets jealous. And so that is who we are. Is there a little place in our day for us to have to stand firm and say, I don't care if the nations do it and if Washington does it. I don't care if L.A. does it. We are Christians. Let's celebrate the Lord's Supper. Father in heaven, for just a minute, we'll pause here. And as we leave, we will remember who we are that we are people of a new covenant, not a people under law that said he's coming and you need him, but a people under grace that say he has come and we have received him. We are a people that have been brought into an obedience to God, necessarily so, by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But as Paul said, we are all baptized by one spirit, into one body at the point of faith. And so we, these cardinal people on the earth, people with a mission, people with a message, people with an authority from men who saw him, people with a, uh, a means of doing this by the Holy Ghost, and you have left us here to herald this until you come. Father, we'll remember every Sunday that we will of where our salvation comes from. We will remember that God has intervened on our behalf. We'll remember where our source of truth comes from, our standard of right comes from, our salvation comes from, the future of the earth where it comes from, heaven's ultimate king where he will come from, that our standard of right and wrong is not from us, but it is from glory that we are not of the nations. We are not primarily Americans or Russians or Cubans or even Jews, that we are called out to the ecclesia, the church, the conscience of the world, the light and salt of man, those who dictate culture. There can be no culture without cult without right, without rules, without truth. And so, Father, strengthen us as we commune with you and fellowship with the one who sacrificed himself. 